It's Tuesday, May the 2nd, 2023, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow, and I'll be your moderator today, a job made considerably easier by the presence of three of the smartest men I know, our Goodfellows as we jokingly refer to them. That would include the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, and the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. They are Hoover Institution Senior Fellows all. And joining us today is the author, journalist, and according to at least one American publication, provocateur, Douglas Murray. Douglas joins us to discuss the future of the West, its alliances, HR and Neil, its economics, John, and the potential unraveling of its social fabric, something Douglas gets into in his wonderful book, The War on the West, How to Prevail in the Age of Reason. And before that, we're going to talk about the big news in London this weekend, which is, of course, the coronation of King Charles III and Her Majesty the Queen Consort. But first, I'd like to take you inside the world of the Hoover Institution for a moment. Last week, we Hoover Fellows mourned the loss of our colleague, the economist John Racian. I doubt many of you have heard the name John Racian, but he was enormously important in the life of our institution. John served as Hoover's director from 1990 to 2015. 25 years, yes. Just as it was a different world in 1990, so too was it a very different Hoover Institution. Our finances were not secure, our relationship with Stanford University was strained at best, and the institution's outlook was decidedly murky. So John, who was a very quiet man, quietly got to work behind the scenes, and he righted the ship, and he got us on its current course, which has us back to our full health. In fact, much of what you see of the Hoover Institution today is thanks to John's hard work. We are today, thanks to his contributions, a vibrant center of intellectual thought and stellar research, addressing today's greatest challenges. Neil, you tweeted about John's passing. Would you like to offer a few words? I would indeed. Uh, John uh, was uh, a visionary, but a a quiet, understated, self-effacing visionary. When we used the phrase ideas defining a free society, we're using a John Raisian phrase. Uh, At a gathering we held just after his uh, death at Hoover, I told the story of of how John Raisian wooed me. and, And I've never been wooed like I was wooed by John to come to Hoover. And he patiently, quietly over the years, uh, persuaded me that that's actually where I uh, belong. So I owe him, and my wife Ayan owes him uh, a very great deal. But but above all, Hoover owes him because, as you rightly as you rightly said, uh, he really he righted the ship, uh, and he did more than that. He kind of rebuilt the ship in many ways. Okay, John H.R. Well, I'll add two cents there. Of course, my wooing was very easy. Uh, John Razian, hey, John, you want a job at Hoover? John Cochran, yes. <laughs> uh, but he, um, John was the kind of guy who could do things that way, and Hoover could move nimbly and quickly uh, when, when opportunities came. Um, we don't, um, we tend to celebrate the prima donnas, otherwise known as the good fellows around here, but um, a uh, institution like Hoover's really depends on people like John who devote their lives and energies to building the great institution that that the uh, that that uh, is the foundation for what people like us can do. And I think um, you know John, John needs celebration because what he achieved was was really remarkable. And and Hoover is very grateful for his efforts. And HR, he was almost as happy and upbeat as you are. <laughs> he was. He's a generous person, an empathetic person, and 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 he and Claudia were just a, a, a joy to be around. You know, and I remember when I first met him, I was a lieutenant colonel here as a, as a as a military fellow uh, in in uh, 2002 to 2003, and uh, and that's when I first got to know him. And and he said to me, "Hey, you know, when you retire from the army, you know where you should be going. You should come to is come back to Hoover and." And uh, and he, you know, I, I think it was a big part of, of, of me being able to join the team afterwards. And, you know, I, I, can't, I arrived here, you know, in, in 2002 as a kind of a, you know, kind of a, a beer drinking East Coast guy. And John introduced me to California Cabernets, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and I still have some of of his bottles here, which I, which uh, when we all get together, we'll have to we'll have to toast John with one of those those uh, those old 2006 bottles. Great idea. So from the Hoover family to the Racian family, uh, we mourn your loss. And I'm not sure we can ever fully thank you for all that John Racian did for the Hoover Institution. But suffice to say, he will be missed. 
So on with the show, Douglas, we haven't forgotten about you. And let's turn now our attention to London. And uh, despite the accent, our viewers should know you are not in London right now. You're in New York, I believe. I don't know if you intend to go across the pond to the festivities or not. Uh, let's begin this conversation with a very simple question. Charles III turned 75 in November. Um, he held the title of Prince of Wales, I think, for 64 years. Uh, he has spent not just years, but decades preparing for this moment. Douglas, is he the right man at the right moment to take on this responsibility? <laughs> uh, that's a very uh, um, loaded question in a way. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to London shortly after the coronation, my uh, invitation having got lost in the post. Um, I, uh, you know, one of the things about hereditary monarchy is um, you never really know. I mean, it's, 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 it's a lottery, isn't it? It's the nature of it. It's a lottery. It's a lottery of birth. It's a lottery of accident, of, of person, of character, of the time they're in, luck, um, and much more. Uh, uh, the king is having a sort of slight austerity coronation, for instance, because it's been deemed by his advisors that to have an awful lot of peers of the realm and dukes all arriving in ermine and so on might not hit the tenor of the times. I happen to totally disagree with that. I think that uh, there should be as much ermine as possible. There should be as many dukes as possible. I think the whole thing should be a spectacular parade and should be an example of what Britain does best. And uh, there will be lots of discussion about the anachronisms and all that sort of thing. But what's the point of having an, ac an anachronistic institution if you don't have anachronisms? Um, uh, as for whether or not he's the right man, the truth is, is there are several different interpretations of, 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 of uh, King Charles, as we now call him. Uh, there are, and, and I suppose they, they, they fall into two categories. The first is a perception which has dogged him throughout his life that he's a sort of uh, slightly soggy green do-gooder uh, who talks to his plants and uh, goes on about the environment and 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 things like that and and of course interferes in politics that's always dogged him not without some justification because he has certainly you know, been found writing letters to ministers and things like that which in a constitutional monarchy like the uk is is a bit of an intervention in politics of a kind that's not particularly suitable however that interpretation of him has i think hidden uh, a, a much deeper and, to my mind, more important one, which is that he is actually a man of considerable thoughtfulness. Um, he has, He's certainly an extremely um, a kind and decent man. He's shown that in his uh, dealings with his own family, testing as that has often been. Um, but the people who know him all attest to this as well. Um, it is not the job, of course, of the monarch to do anything really other than to preside uh, beneficently over the progress of politics. And I would just say that, you know, when when the late Queen died, I, I was in America, in America most of my time these days, and um, I found it very interesting, the number of friends, particularly of the right, who said to me things like, you know, I admire her, I just don't really get it like i don't get what it is about the monarch that that causes such i mean at one point i was actually on air and i was talking about the virtues of stoicism that her late majesty em embodied and i could feel my bottom lip wobble and i thought for god's sake douglas don't cry when you're extolling the virtues of stoicism <laughs> but, um but 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 a, but a number of friends of mine said to me you know uh, i don't quite get it and I found, I don't know if it's an original observation, but it was for me that I found that I said to my friends in America, you know, it, it's like the flag if the flag were embodied. You swear allegiance to the flag. It in, it's what you fight for. It's, it, it, it's what you face towards. Well, the monarch is like that. Now, of course, Queen Elizabeth II earned that as well by her decades of service. Much of that is passed on to her son, but not all of it. I grew up in a, a monarchist family, although my family's politics ranged from a card-carrying communist uh, to dyed-in-the-wool unionist conservative. Uh, all members of the family, even uh, great-uncle Alfred the communist, uh, showed great respect uh, for the 
the queen and the, the monarchy as an institution. And I think that's an extraordinarily important point that we have uh, as head of state uh, in the United Kingdom, someone who is above politics and has been above politics now for centuries. Uh, so that that's that's important. My, my grandfather was really a man of the left, of the moderate left, Labour supporting later a, a liberal. But I can remember how he would always make us on Christmas Day listen uh, to the Queen's uh, address to the nation. And he stood to attention uh, for the national anthem, having served in, in World War II. So that, that set an example uh, to the younger members of the family. Uh, there was a play a few years ago called Charles III, uh, which I don't know if you saw it, Douglas. It was rather good. Uh, it was a pastiche Shakespearean tragedy uh, in which uh, Charles uh, ascended to the throne and almost immediately became embroiled in politics uh, over the issue of the freedom of the press and plunged the country almost uh, in a matter of months into a, a constitutional crisis. I remember going to see it with another who a fellow, George Osborne, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was booed on the way into and out of the theatre to his great delight. Uh, but, but the play's vision that Charles would actually break the monarchy has uh, stuck in my mind for a while. Because, of course, it's almost impossible for anybody to follow Elizabeth II's extraordinary reign and her amazing judgment uh, when it came to locating the monarchy uh, in the modern world. Uh, and, and Charles will have a, a huge challenge uh, to, to achieve continuity. He can't be exactly the same, and he's not going to be. He's going to get criticized, as he has been really for most of his life, for being uh, somewhat susceptible to modern ideological fashion. And I'm sure uh, the Daily Mail has already run at least four pieces calling him the, the woke monarch. Yeah. Uh, but but I sense that what's going on here is pretty much what went on in his mother's reign. They're trying to tweak an, an historic institution to make sure that it doesn't look hopelessly out of touch. And and, and when, when I hear uh, accusations of wokeism, I think to myself of what my own experience was when I met him and spent some time with him at Sandringham. He's, as Douglas said, a very thoughtful uh an intellectual individual with considerable emotional uh, depth. One has to remember how brilliantly he navigated a, a marriage that was really intended for public consumption, not for private use, blew up horribly publicly. Uh, he handled that with extraordinary dexterity. And to me, most impressively, uh, his relationship with his uh, sons when I spent time with him seemed extraordinarily strong, particularly with uh, his elder son. So I'm I'm not as worried as some people about how this is going to go. And I'll put up with a certain amount of uh, fashion following, because I think that's how the monarchy survived in Britain. If it, had, if it had remained exactly as it was in Victoria's time, or God forbid, in the Hanoverian time, if nothing had changed, it wouldn't be around, I suspect. It's the adaptability that served them so well. I wonder if either of our Yanks on this call would like to take a contrarian view and tell me that maybe the monarchy is an outdated idea or just following the British royalty is kind of a phenomenal waste of time. John, HR, do you want to want to venture down that path? Well, it is interesting. You know, our our country is dedicated to the proposition that, that this is not the way to do things, <laughs> uh, that we don't do kings and titles and so forth. And, you know, we, we believe in meritocracy and, you know, we, that we had a different solution to the problem in the 18th century of the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, the problem with monarchy being you get whoever's there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we supposedly had a peaceful one. Now, um, you know, so, but we got to look respectfully at what it has become, as our our Brits told us, uh, <laughs> really a symbol of durable institutions. And I think that's something uh, to respect. I think we need symbols of durable institutions. And uh, boy, uh, yeah, go for the pomp and circumstance. There's nothing like the uh, the the British monarchy or the Catholic Church to do pomp and circumstance right. Uh, now you know as as to the woke business, um, and you know so what's a poor constitutional monarch to do all day? Uh, and they they have sort of taken the idea of sort of 
But what first ladies uh, or someday first husbands do in the U.S., they have to work in the world of philanthropy. Well, the world of philanthropy is is nothing but um, an untrammeled wokeism these days. So it'd be very hard for poor Charles to avoid soggy green do-gooderism. I got to write that one down. That was great. I, I do kind of appreciate his efforts on, on behalf of architecture and calling yeah. out uh, how absolutely atrocious much of the um, uh, modern architecture that infected London uh, was. So some soggy green do is, is useful. Hey, I just hope the monarchy continues to to unite people, you know, in, in the UK and, and in the Commonwealth. Because I mean, I, I look at our, us today, I mean, it seems like everything divides us further, you know, so this is a, an institution that does bring people to, together. And, and, and I like Douglas's description of, 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 uh, of the monarch as, as the flag embodied. So um, I just hope that continues. I mean, I hope that the, the King Charles uh, continues, you know, to, to be regarded uh, as Queen Elizabeth II was as a, as a unifier. Is the monarchy also a little bit political? Isn't it not a, a break glass in case of fire institution? The Spanish king came back and, and sort of rescued them from a horrible situation. Well, that's certainly true in the case of Spain. Um, we don't actually know what would happen in the case of the UK. And there have been occasions, famously in Australia at one point some decades ago, um, uh, where the where the monarch does actually play a, a sort of political role. It's the, the truth is is that as we found in recent years, certainly since the Brexit vote, there are some unsettled issues in the British non-constitution which occasionally risk erupting, and which when they do worry me deeply. Uh, uh, um, but if I can just throw in one other one quick observation in relation to something you said, John, um, about uh, the way in which America is, is, is set up versus the way in which Britain is, I would just add one thing. I'm sure that like me, Neil occasionally gets asked about, you know, whether you can become a, whether you want to become a full on American citizen. And I, I can't remember what your situation is now, Neil, but uh, um, I, I've come to say, well, you know, I, I find it I find it hard to forswear all allegiance to the crown. Although it's, I think one of the things that uh, is in the wording in America, if you become a citizen, is to forswear allegiance to all foreign princes. Um, but she's uh, not foreign, Douglas. Um, th this is the thing. Uh, and um, I, I am a dual citizen. I became an American citizen, as uh, uh, as my colleagues know, back, back in, in 2018. Uh, and I've always felt that uh, it's uh, a perfectly straightforward reconciliation of two quite uh, admirable traditions uh, in uh, the political philosophy of the English speaking world. Uh, the tradition of, of hereditary constitutional monarchy, which has succeeded admirably well uh, in, uh, in Britain, and the tradition of, uh, of a republic based on, on laws, uh, the separation of powers, which is has succeeded uh, in North America, both both ideas uh, of, of of British provenance. So yes, when I was uh, doing that particular oath, I thought to myself, the Queen's not foreign. Uh, well, and, and I was going to make the point that, that, that of course, uh, among other things, uh, there are at least two foreign princes who it's quite easy to pour swear allegiance to these days. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if you're allowed to pick and choose. Um, <laughs> we must move on from the monarchy, I know, because actually, although I, I revere the monarchy, I find it rather boring as an institution, in a way, which is as it should be. But if I may just make one very quick observation, one of my defences of constitutional monarchy is I believe that all human beings are deeply interested in watching DNA work out. It's a, a perennial issue. Uh, we want to know the, the degree to which there is any elasticity in what we inherit in our genes. And when we we see this in obsession with uh, um, dynasties or dynasties um, across the world, my one of my defences of monarchy is that it gets that out in one grand way. In other words, we obsess about one family and the way in which does does he more resemble his mother than his father? Is this his father? Is this his mother? And so on. But at least we don't get it in politics. Uh, and I would argue that the obsession in American life with di dynastic politics is one consequence of not being able to get that out of your system in a monarchy. Uh, I mean, nobody says, I wonder what whether the Blairs uh, should be the next generation again. Or I mean, John Major's wife 
was never deemed likely to run for <laughs> political office. Um, nobody says, I wonder what Major Junior is doing. Like, Mark, Mark Thatcher, why doesn't he run? Um, uh, uh, nobody wants to know whether, whether, whether you know, uh, um, David Cameron's children are going to enter the arena. It, it seems absurd in British politics, and yet in American politics, it's an overwhelming obsession. The idea that there is a sort of small number of families who can basically run things, and we'll keep our eye on them, and if only the, the Clintons and the Obamas would intermarry uh, with the Bushes, then, then uh, we sort of needn't have an election again. This is a brilliant point, Douglas. I was reading Peggy Noonan's column only yesterday in which she prophesied that a man named Kennedy would become one of the <laughs> contenders uh, in the next presidential election, despite the fact that he's obviously off his rocker. Uh, yes. So I, I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, what would television scriptwriters do without the Windsors and the Murdochs to generate material? And look, notice there's a further point. It's all right uh, for a monarch uh, to get rather old, rather long in the tooth. But we expect elected politicians in uh, the UK to be quite young. I, I won't continue the thought because I think listeners can probably know, can probably infer where I'm going with that. Gentlemen, let's move on to the larger question of the future of the viability of the West. Neil, you recently gave a presentation at the Hoover Institution, and I want to read back a little bit of what you've said in this to get your thoughts on this. And here's what you said, quote, the West, a motley group of former wartime allies and adversaries, mostly committed to democracy, but with heterogeneous cultures and institutions and a growing ambivalence toward free markets, John Cochran has once again demonstrated its strategic incoherence, H.R. McMaster, in the first phase of Cold War II. You went on to add, when looking at the West outlook, quote, it is, quote, bleak because the asymmetry in the Western, in the Atlantic Alliance makes it excessively reliant on U.S. public opinion. Are things really that bad, Neil? Well, this is in reaction to my being told over and over again that there is something uh, uh, called the West uh, that is based on a liberal international order uh, and is capable of solving all problems. And uh, from a historian's vantage point, this is uh, this is something one has to question. Uh, and it, it seems to me that the war in Ukraine has once again revealed uh, the diversity of of political cultures uh, that uh, that really we we lump together as the, as the West. Look at a map. Uh, of the, the the world in relation to the war in Ukraine. And it's essentially uh, the periphery, uh, the rim against the Eurasian heartland. And uh, by by rim, I mean uh, the the countries of of, of North America, uh, of of Europe, but I really should say Western and Central Europe. Uh, and then the the Antipodes, Australia, New Zealand, and, and Japan. Um, and so it's a, a really a very uh, heterogeneous group of, of countries that one's talking about. Uh, and it's clear that the attitudes towards this conflict vary a good deal. Germans think about this war very, very differently uh, from Americans or, or, or Brits. And that's why I stress what, when we're talking about the West, we're talking about this strange group of, of former allies and adversaries that came together in Cold War I in the face of the Soviet threat. The threats today are a bit different because Putin's Russia is less uh, of a formidable foe than the Soviet Union was, and China has become much, much more important. And I think in Cold War II, it will be hard to keep what we've been used to calling the West uh, uh, together um, because uh, there are significant parts of this grouping that, that just are far too in bed with China economically uh, to feel comfortable uh, with Cold War II. I think uh, the, the most telling slide I showed when I gave that talk was the huge imbalance between US support, financial and military, uh, for Ukraine and the support of all the other members of the West. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the contributions are absolutely trivial in relation uh, to gross domestic product. So I think we shouldn't delude ourselves about this. There's been a lot of, I think, rather um, uh, starry-eyed celebration of transatlantic unity since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, but I keep reminding people that this war could last longer than you think. Uh, wars that have lasted a year generally last more than one more year. 
And uh, keeping this uh, coalition together, it's going to be challenging. And that is what Vladimir Putin is counting on. He's, he's counting on the fact that as we go on through this year and into next year, it's going to get tougher and tougher to maintain uh, unity and American public commitment, because that's that's the Achilles heel uh, that the West has. The American public has a tendency to get disillusioned with any long term commitment far away, even if, uh, uh, as in this case, it doesn't, in fact, involve American lives being put on the line, just American money. So that that's what motivated my somewhat skeptical take. John, ambivalence about free markets. Do you agree with Dr. Ferguson? Um, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you phrase this in terms of uh, the West and the decline yes. of the West. And uh, I, I, I'm more optimistic than Neil in the grand uh, strategy question. There's no other idea that anybody really believes in for how to run things. Uh, if we fall apart, we will implode. We will not be um, invaded and 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 uh, by by. China and, and sent out that way. Um, you know, the, the crowning idea of our political system is not technocratic competence, but that we stumble from disaster to disaster, but always come out on top. Uh, you know, the central point of democracy, even of, of people uh, voting, is, is to occasionally right the ship when the elites go off uh, on some crazy idea. And, and they tend to do that in, in a rough and ready way. So, you know, on the grand, is the West going to come out on top? Okay. Uh, yes, the trend economically right now is to sort of the Brusselsification of everything. And uh, I'm, I'm particularly sad to see that we're going for industrial policy, for trade restrictions, uh, for all the things we know um, don't work. Um, sadly, because we were the leaders on going in the opposite direction, uh, more and more governments running things. Uh, the, uh, under the guise of resilience, we're going to bring the great success of the Jones Act to the uh, semiconductor industry and, and much else. That's kind of sad to see sort of creeping uh, creeping dysfunction. But that's not that's not in the grand strategic term to the end of the West. This is this is a, a bad war, but it's not Germany invading uh, Poland and France. Uh, mm -hmm. I would love to see us, um, you know, decisively win and, and tell China not to invade Taiwan. But if you're asking future of the West, you know, even losing Taiwan is probably like losing North Vietnam. It's going to be horrible for a while, but not sort of the end of the world. But we, we have a guest who has written whole books about this, who we should hear from rather than us rambling along. Well, I actually I wanted to hear from H.R. McMaster, among others, but about this question of of, of unity, uh, certainly on the military front, because I, I, my my interpretation of the last of the last uh, year and a bit since the invasion of Ukraine has actually been that that I mean I I I, I sympathise with with Neil's desire not to be overly um, well to overly talk up what has been achieved because this is doubtless going to be an I agree a much longer game um, than many people are prepared for, and I think public disillusionment, in particularly in America, and particularly in the American right, is one of the great threats to the unity of the coalition on this. But I just wanted to throw in that nevertheless, if we were talking 18 months ago, would we have expected the degree of unity which we found once the Russian tanks rolled in? I mean, there has been, there has definitely been, as Neil says, Germany has ne needed early on more coaxing than one might have liked for reasons we all know. Um, certain allies have proved not as good allies as one might have hoped. But nevertheless, um, a number of very big questions of recent decades have sort of been answered to some degree. I mean, I remember some 20 years ago doing a report on the future of NATO with uh, uh, well, then uh, General Shalikashvili in America and, uh, and, and uh, Field Marshal Lord Inge in the UK. I remember the question we were addressing was, you know, with the NATO, what's the point of NATO? And, and as of la February before last, th that question was answered again. And, um, you know, ha has there been as much unity and and so on as one would have liked? No. Has there been much more than one would have expected? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's possible, and it's the analogy I would use, it's possible that at the top level, as it were, at the penthouse level of this, things are actually rather more secure than we thought. Nevertheless, it is the foundations, it's, it's the basement level, it's the ground floor that I think is at risk. And I, I just, before handing over to you on this, I mean, I, you know, my observation early on was that, that 
It was Germany that was the weak link, that Putin was waiting for Germany, maybe France, maybe Italy to be picked off. And actually, I think, uh, you know, public opinion polls in America are the ones that, that worry me now. And as a friend of mine in Germany said to me the other week, who would have thought that it was America that one would have feared going weak on this question, you know? Well, I'd like to hear what those thinks about about the you know, the effect of leadership in in, in galvanizing uh, you know national will, and I think that's what what's lacking. I don't think the president has done a very good job of, at explaining what is at stake and then what we're doing uh, to support Ukraine uh, to help them achieve a, a favorable outcome uh, at an acceptable cost and 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 uh, and and risk. You know, and and I, I think that that lack of a, of a clear strategic vision has us mired in, in talking about the tactics of, you know, this weapon or that weapon or how much military support in terms of a dollar figure. So I, I do think leadership can have a big influence. And in terms of Neil's diagnosis, you know, I, I think that this is a, we're at the cusp of a, maybe a generational shift. You know, I, I think in the 90s, we did take a holiday from history. You know, we believe that a you know, great power competition was a relic of the past. And, and I think the last two decades have been sort of a consistent wake up call in that connection uh beginning with 911 but then also you know also uh involving the you know the growing strength of of China and China's aggression you know in the South China Sea and vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and on the Himalayan frontier and and as of course various forms of economic uh aggression and, and informational uh and propaganda aggression as well so uh cyber aggression so i th i think that we are now awake to this to the threat that that um you know the the first you know the first land war in Europe, major land war in Europe since World War II poses. You know, I I mean it, it is generational to a large extent. I think. I mean when I when I when I was uh, a a first year, you know, a senior at West Point, just prior to commissioning, we looked across the parade field and saw the forty year reunion of the class of nineteen forty four, and so mm -hmm. we all knew that our mission was to prevent that from ever happening again. Mm. And I think we lost focus on that, and maybe maybe uh, uh, we're beginning to understand, you know, that 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 kind of a cataclysmic, disastrous war could occur if we're not vigilant, if we don't demonstrate strength. Could I? I just want to add some HR-ish uh, notes of optimism quickly. Uh, I noticed last week India and China voted in the UN to censor Russia for its invasion. That was pretty remarkable. NATO, of course, is now expanded and invigorated. And as far as getting other people to pay, uh, we are we spend about 3% of GDP on military. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, and no great power in history has ever spent so little on, on, on its military. And when we complain about other people not spending, remember, the guy who picks up the check gets to pick the restaurant, and we might not uh, want to complain so much, and, and we might not want to do handing over who, who gets to pick the restaurant if somebody else starts paying the check. On a point of information, actually, the 19th century Britain ran an extraordinarily cost-effective empire with uh, remarkably low defense spending in relation to GDP. Uh, but what they also did was they ran a very sound fiscal policy uh, with primary budget surpluses reducing the debt to GDP ratio consistently from the very elevated uh, uh, height of the post-1815. And that's what the US isn't doing. The thing that worries me, just to go to John's uh, favorite topic, is that at some point this decade, the cost of debt service will exceed the defense budget of the United States. And I've, I've said for many years that that is a real tipping point for any great power. Uh, I, I said strategic incoherence in that passage that uh, that Bill quoted, and and I worry a little bit that the Chinese may have more strategic coherence at this point. Notice uh, they are now the ones who appear to be uh, posturing as the peace brokers, yes. uh, and and this is actually quite hazardous uh, for the United States if the initiative goes uh, to China. I, I think that's that's the best news. Uh, for Putin that there's there's been in many months, because any peace that China brokers will be a far, far better outcome for Putin than we would want to see. So the, the incoherence that worries me is I don't hear anybody in Washington, or for that matter in London, telling me how this war ends in a way that would be uh, emphatically not only to Ukraine's uh, benefit, but to ours. Uh, it's a very open-ended commitment we've made. We consistently say that it's up to the Ukrainians when the war ends. That is not a strategically coherent way 
uh, to run our, our foreign policy with all due respect to Team Biden. Right, well put. Uh, I'd like to pose a question to Douglas, and this gets to his wonderful book, The War on the West. Um, in explaining the book, Douglas, you introduced two phrases, one culture of ingratitude and the other societies of resentment. What exactly are you getting at, and how do you reverse those mentalities? Uh, well, I'm... Um... Let me use the shorthand that uh, actually Elon Musk rather helpfully provided uh, the other day in his interview with Bill Maher. Um, it is the thing where you speak to a student at any American university and ask them what they know about George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. They tell you that they were slave owners. And then you say, anything else? And it, you, hard to get anything out of them. I recently did a tour of universities in the South and, you know, even at Thomas Jefferson's own university at UVA, um, they're ashamed, uh, they're embarrassed, um, they don't know what to do because people in the past turn out not to have all the views we have in 2023. Who could have guessed? Um, I, I'm sure that we believe that our own views will be held for all the millennia to come. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, we have this culture of, yes, um, ingratitude and self-excoriation. Uh, it is absolutely embedded now in America. It's why the rest of the Anglosphere is picking up this American mind virus and why certain countries like France are actually trying to cut themselves off from American cultural influence because they say, we just don't want this here. Um, uh, I think this, um, to my mind, this is one of the biggest threats that America faces. All the questions of, you know, defense spending, uh, whether or not America wants to remain the global hegemon thing, all fall away if you believe that there's nothing good about America. I mean, for instance, what, what American school child is not taught that slavery was the founding sin of America? I deeply resent this language, as well as I think it being ahistorical. If America has a founding sin, fine. What's the founding sin of Nigeria? What's the founding sin of Egypt? Zimbabwe, China, France, you could go on and on. Why does only America have a founding sin? Why does everything in America have to be rewritten in this negative key in this generation? Why is, why after 20 something years of the internet, have we become stupider in our public debate to the extent that we now disagree over what, which year or century America was founded? And where, not to get into one of the distractions of our time, but where we don't even agree on what a woman is. I mean, wh why, why have we allowed ourselves to slip into this place of, of, of self-abnegation? And my own view is that it is because in our lifetimes, in the lifetimes of all of us here, we have moved from a celebration of heroism as being the great public virtue to a celebration of victimhood being the great public virtue. And uh, we have all seen this coming in our lifetimes. I personally abhor it. Uh, like I think everyone present, I was brought up with a different ethic. Um, but the, the, the ethic of, res of, of resentment, uh, I, I quote in The War in the West, I quote Nietzsche carefully, as I always say, uh, he's he, he, a great one of the great thinkers of all time, but nevertheless, a thinker that you have to deal with carefully. In the genealogy of morals, Nietzsche has this great insight on the person of resentment, who, as he says, among other things, um, likes to tear at wounds long since healed and then cry about his hurt. Ring any bells? Um, another example, of course, is what Nietzsche says about the person of resentment, that really what they need is somebody to stand across their lives. Even Nietzsche isn't sure who. He says maybe a secular priest, and it's very telling that even Nietzsche can't quite say who could perform this task. But somebody needs to stand across the life of the person of resentment and say, actually, yes, you are correct. There is a person who has ruined your life. There is a person who has ruined your life in the world entire. The person is you. Now, nobody would ever want to perform that task. That's why even the secular priest is a sort of attempt to uh, come up with an idea of who could perform that task. But if that person does not exist and say, actually, it is you. It is you who has ruined your life. Nobody else has held you back. 
as, as uh, Morgan Freeman famously said in an interview many years ago, the, the, the bus leaves town every day. That bus leaves every day. But if you didn't get on it, in America and the wider West now, everyone can say, oh, it's not your fault you didn't get on it. Other people were holding you back from it. Systemic reasons were holding you back, maybe systemic racism. Maybe everybody with white skin was holding you off getting on the bus, et cetera, et cetera. And, this, and now this has spilled out, not just from minority communities, but to the majority, which is why we see these extraordinary figures like almost 100% as far as one can see now of people at university in America identifying as LGBTQIA+. We must have heterosexuals put into a minority group quite soon at this rate. Um, but they, they identify as this because they want a bit of a victimhood pie. They want a bit of it because it's what we celebrate now in America and in the wider West. And I find it absolutely disgusting and don't mind admitting it. I want to ask you, well, your view of, uh, I'll give my diagnosis quickly and, and maybe you'll react. What I see is a combination of a, a religious movement, the sort of thing that pops out every now and then, a Savonarola moment, a we are all guilty moment, a largely among wealthy college educated white people uh, to feel horrible for sins and people go through that. But that combined with a very uh, clever political movement, which exploits this, uh, takes over the institutions of civil society, even though not the majority of people who vote, and is quite anti-democratic, is quite authoritarian. This is take over the institutions of civil society and shove it down your throat. It, it gives the the it gives a reason for um, uh, making the other evil. You know, all all of X are evil, and therefore. Uh, not entitled to the usual norms of our turn now, your turn later, but rather we'll take over and shove it down. So you you, mer you merge a a, a guilt-inducing messianic cult with a very clever political um, uh, organization, and a small minority can can do that. In some sense, what Bolshevik ideology did uh, in Russia, not an exact analogy, but the, the marriage of a religious movement with a, a political movement that wants to seize power, basically. Now, can I give an example? Because some of our viewers may may not have kids in school at the moment or, or students at, at university, and, and I'm not sure that, that they'll be aware of how rapidly things have moved in the ways that uh, Douglas and John are talking about. I, I had occasion recently to look at teaching materials that were being considered for use with grade five uh, children, 11 year olds or thereabouts. Uh, these were historical teaching materials, although it wasn't called history, I think it was called social studies. And these materials uh, came from a, a program called Learning for Justice, which turned out when I little, did a little digging to be run by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, one of the most dubious organizations uh, in uh, the field of uh, a political activism. It pretends to be a civil rights organization. It really isn't. So let me give you two examples of the teaching points, uh, the essential knowledge that these materials were supposed to uh, give students after they had studied the module on slavery in American history. Number one, Students will know that the United States was founded on protecting the economic interests of white Christian men who owned property. Uh, and here's the second one I'll give you. Students will know that after the Civil War, formerly enslaved people faced many obstacles, including racism and political, social and economic inequality. Their descendants continue to face similar oppression today. These were being presented uh, to schools, to teachers, as uh, legitimate objectives of education in a fifth grade classroom. And I'm afraid to say that schools all over America uncritically take this kind of material and put it in the classroom and start instilling these ideas uh, in, in children. And it was only in this case, uh, because I kicked up a fuss, that it didn't happen at the school my uh, kids go to. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And it is extraordinarily insidious the way it works. Well, no, I, I agree completely with, with uh, Douglas's diagnosis here. This is the, the valorization of, of victimhood, and it's connected to this curriculum of self-loathing. 
uh, in the university. And you know, when I when I look today at, at uh, you know, some of the recruiting problems in the military, I think part of it is connected uh, to to teaching our children that their country is not you know, not worth defending. You know, yeah. so I. I, I really am concerned about it. I hope that there's a corrective. I mean, we've been through periods like this. You know, I I, I think back to like the 1970s, right? And and um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm going to use a Clinton quotation here. And again, it's 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 George Clinton from Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, the, the 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 album was America Eats Its Young, which came out in 1972. And some of the lyrics were, were consistent with Stoic philosophy. The, the lyrics were, ain't you deep in your semi-first class seat? You protest this and protest that and eat yourself fat. You don't like what you're about. But then it goes on to say, situation is just that. It has no power over you. And then and the, and this, these are all lyrics of the, of, the, um, of the track. If you don't like the effect, don't produce the cause. And so what, I, what I'm concerned about is that this curriculum robs people of agency. As right. Douglas said, right? You put the word systemic or institutional in front of every problem, what, what you can't do anything about it. So you're, you're left with a toxic combination of, of really anger and resignation. Mm. So I, I just think we have to make a conscious effort to correct, you know, this, this kind of pernicious, you know, uh, uh, you know curriculum in, in, in schools. And gosh, you know, that, that we'd be teaching 11 year olds that, Neil, it's just, I mean, that's really really disturbing but douglas i'd like to hear what your pro what you think the prospects are for recovery here like what can do do we need do we need george clinton to 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 make a comeback here he's still he's still on tour but uh <laughs> um, <laughs> my own view is that is that the um the solution is right in front of us uh, i mean the thing that disturbs me if i can just say so quickly as well is is the fact as i mentioned or alluded to that, that this comes now from the right and the left the, the American right has also become self-loathing about America with uh, some good reason. People uh, um, say, you know, we're so degraded in our public discourse and much more that why would we, for, inst in, uh, for in, uh, example, intervene in another place in the world when we have these terrible ethics ourselves? What's the point? We have nothing good to give. You do hear that from parts of the American right now, um, as you do from the American left. And uh, um, my own view is that the solution is straightforward. As, as Nietzsche says, there is only one um, uh, um, answer to the problem of resentment, and that is gratitude. And one of the things I have write a chapter on gratitude and the war on the West, because I think it is something we simply do not address enough in our culture. Um, uh, uh, the person of resentment cannot be hauled out a pit of resentment by a 15% increase in their social security check. But they can't be hauled out of the pit of resentment by being given reparations for something that they didn't suffer, given to them by people who did no wrong. The only thing deep enough that speaks at a deep enough level to try to cancel out resentment is gratitude. And the opportunity for gratitude is all around us. Um, I have a friend who Neil knows as well, who's a headmistress in the UK, and I occasionally have, 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 have um, asked her, as I have with other people I know in teaching, um, what do you find is one of the most useful ways to deal with a child who is really playing up and is really difficult? And she said, a number of teachers have said this to me, you know, quite often, if this is if they're immigrant origin children, um, I encourage their family to take them back to their country of origin to meet their first cousins. They come back transformed. Here I was in London or DC or New York, thinking that no one in world history had had a worse lot in life than myself. I have all of these structures that, the, that I've been told wind around me like a spider's web so that I can achieve nothing in my life. And yet it turns out I have food, I have rights, I have the law, and historically speaking, and in the world today, these are all very unusual, or at least most of them are. Now, if, if, if America can't say to its young, 
and to its old as well, because it's as uh, was mentioned earlier, it's, it's 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 a lot of old people who've got this wrong as well. If they can't say this is highly unusual, and here's why it's good, then I don't know who in the world has a more compelling story. Maybe I can just finish on this thought. Yeah, you know, I was, I recently was um was looking at actually at UVA the one, the, the, one of the copies of the Declaration of Independence, and I, 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 one of the things that immediately struck me, of course, was. Um, the, 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 the sight of the signatories reminded me, of course, of the signatories on the death warrant. Here, maybe we return to where we started. The signatories on the death warrant of Charles I. As everybody knows, if you appended your signature to the death warrant of Charles I, it was best that you died before Charles II came. Um, if if you did, then it was just your corpse dug up, uh, dug up hung, drawn, and quartered, as with the corpse of Oliver Cromwell. If you were unfortunate to still be alive, you were hunted down, hanged, drawn, and quartered in real time. Um, that was the cost of appending your, your, your signature to a document like this. And when the founding fathers and the signatories of the Declaration of Independence appended their signatures there, they were doing something equally dangerous. And only one other place in the world, France, was attempting a non-monarchical republic, and they went straight to the terror. So if there's a solution to this, I would say, teach American school children the luck, the great good fortune they have to be living in a republic founded by Thomas Jefferson, George Washington and others, and not by Robespierre. <laughs> teach them that, and that it was by the thinnest of margins, and the thinnest of margins was a small number of remarkable, yes, dead, yes, white, yes, men. Those three great sins of our time, to not only be white and male, but dead. What losers. <laughs> but if you taught them, it's because of these dead white men that you have any rights today. You could turn it around. It is, as Paul Johnson said in his opening, uh, opening sentence of his history of the American people 20 years ago, in a sentence you could not imagine being written today, the story of the American people is the greatest story ever told. Douglas Murray, you've been more than generous with your time today. We appreciate your wise words, your keen insights. Uh, tell our viewers and our listeners where they can read your columns, where they can hear your voice. Um, yeah, they can read my columns in many places, including the New York Post. Uh, including in The Spectator, uh, National Review, The Sun. Uh, some people think almost every newspaper is not quite true. But, uh, <laughs> and of course, my most recent book, The War in the West, is available if you can find any bookshops, otherwise, of course, online. And, um, oh, I'm uh, a, a, a prolific, not to say promiscuous podcaster. But this has been a great, this has been a particularly uh, enjoyable act of promiscuity. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. <laughs> Take care, Douglas. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Thanks. Douglas. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the lightning round. Lightning. Deal, we begin with a particularly cheap shot in your direction. Manchester City 4, Arsenal 1. How painful on a scale of 1 to 10 is this? 11. Uh, the, as an Arsenal fan, uh, I, I kind of knew it would end this way. Our hopes of winning the Premier League for the first time in a long time, were dashed, uh, not just by the fact that Manchester City has a vastly larger squad and is therefore uh, <clears throat> less vulnerable to injury. By the way, the reason they have a vastly larger squad is that they do uh, very improper things financially, which they, as far as I know, have yet to be punished uh, for. But we also bungled a series of games we should have won, giving away two goal leads, ending up drawing. So, you know, one can one can whine about the other side, but I I think Arsenal's young uh, squad they bottled it, as they say in Britain, and I think the pressure was just uh, more psychologically than these really talented athletes could handle. But yes, you've touched on a a very raw nerve there, uh, Bill, and all male Fergusons, right down to five year old Campbell, are, are still are still mourning the the dashing of our dream. John Cochran, two questions for you, my friend. One, J.P. Morgan gobbles up most of First Republic's assets, and the Treasury Department assures us that, quote, the banking system remains sound and resilient. Agree or disagree? 
<laughs> you want lightning round on two big questions? Uh, on the last one, I got to bring my Ted Lasso mustache for next time. I'm starting to <laughs> understand. Then, then maybe Neil will understand how Americans feel about this stuff. God, God knows about rugby. Yeah, I guess we've uh, the government finally found a merger it likes, and uh, Chase will take um, Chase will merge with the Fed at some point and, and take over the financial system. Uh, First Republic, look, guys, this is simple. This whole architecture of financial regulation has now been proven bust. They couldn't see plain vanilla interest rate risk first week of a banking class sitting right in front of them. In fact, the Fed was asking banks, what are you going to do when interest rates go down on the eve of the Fed raising interest rates? Uh, this is a colossal institutional failure. Smart people, but just a, a rule book that that nobody could do. X day coming. Um, in yes, it's I don't know if it's June 1st or not, but but um by choice. And I'm we were talking about institutions and long runs and kings and constitutions. I'm a little shocked that this is a deliberately created. Uh, uh, problem. You know, if, if I'm Treasury Secretary, I'm going to say first day, we pay interest in principle on the debt before anything else. We're just going to right. take financial ca- calamity off the table and that they are that they are deliberately making this thing um, loom as a great disaster in order to uh, to to force uh, to force negotiations. I think is right. is irresponsible with 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 the uh, with our inheritance we got from Alexander Hamilton. There's a dead white man who is rolling right. over in his grave uh, right now at the way this is being handled. Neil, do you buy into X Day, which well, we'd explain we by the way is the government defaulting on its debt. Uh, we well, are wait, the government. It's, it's when the government what? hits the debt ceiling and has to stop spending on something right. and Thank they you. choose Thank to you. default on debt rather than other things as a result. Thank, Thank you, Neil. That's a common misunderstanding, and I'm glad you cleared it up. Thank you. Uh, the, the thing here is that we're playing a kind of game of political chicken. chicken. Uh, this game is a familiar one. Uh, it was last played when President Obama was in the White House and John Boehner uh, was the House uh, majority leader. The trouble is, this is a much different economic environment where we're, we're playing the game of chicken. And I will just say that if you look at p- periodic outbreaks of illiquidity in the US Treasury market, we saw it in March 2020, we've seen it even more recently, this is much riskier than the political class understands given the environment we're in. Uh, so I'm I'm worried that, that there's going to be a financial market accident while the politicians are uh, engaging in this entirely artificial brinkmanship. Mm-hmm. H.R. 160 years ago in this day, Stonewall Jackson is mortally wounded at the Battle of Chancellorville. In the McMaster Big Book of American Generals, is Stonewall Jackson overrated, underrated, or treated justly? I think he's treated justly. You know, I, I think that he was kind of the go-to commander for for Lee. Uh, Chancellorsville, just, I mean, the, the, the battle in which he was wounded could have, was probably his, his finest mo- moment in terms of, of enveloping uh, Hooker's forces there. Uh, but you know, and Lee just wasn't quite the same after him. He was a very interesting guy. He was a mathematician and a and a, a very you know a very uh, stoic in, individual. Uh, he wasn't really charismatic. You know, the, the of course he got his name because you know he was being criticized for not taking more bold action uh, at Bull Run. You know, so there's there's uh, there's Jackson standing there like a st- stone wall. He should right. have been uh, more active. So, you know, I think I think history has sort of sorted it out. And uh, and he's he's regarded as as a generally effective commander, uh, but not not a brilliant one. Neil, keeping in the theme of overrated, underrated on this day in 1997, a 43 year old Tony Blair becomes Great Britain's youngest prime minister in 185 years. Is Mr. Blair overrated or underrated? He's very underrated in Britain. It's probably not well understood here in the US how unpopular Tony Blair became, mainly over the Iraq war and uh, his decision to give uh, the invasion uh, wholehearted British support. That that has been uh, a source of considerable and prolonged resentment against him, uh, particularly uh, from his fellow Labour Party uh, members. But I, I think that this is to misunderstand what an incredibly talented politician uh, and, and very successful Prime Minister Tony uh, Blair was. Uh, and he remains, I think, one of the most thoughtful people in British politics. If the Labour Party had Tony Blair as leader today, as opposed to Keir Starmer, who is a less, I think, charismatic and impressive person, there really would be no doubt about how the next election uh, would go. So, under- certainly in his own land. 
And final question for the group, who uh, now that Joe Biden is officially a candidate in 2024, who has the bigger electoral handicap? Is it uh, which is the bigger electoral handicap? Is it President Biden's age or Donald Trump's character? It ought to be Trump's character. It may turn out to be Biden's age. I think most people are underestimating the probability of Donald Trump's being re-elected in 2024. Look closely. Number one, he's front runner for the nomination, and Republican front runners generally get the nomination. Number two, a recession is coming with terrible timing uh, for Joe Biden's re-election hopes. Not uh, for a very long time, uh, actually not for a century, has a president been re-elected when there was a recession in the two years before his re-election attempt. Uh, in more recent times, it got rid of Gerald Ford, it got rid of Jimmy Carter, it got rid of Bush Sr. So I, I think the, the character question may be swept aside by economic dissatisfaction and memories of the Trump economy, which gave you full employment and no inflation. John and HR had noted in the president's three-minute video explaining his uh, case for re-election, not a single mention of the economy, and HR, not a single mention of foreign policy. Well, I think it's just it's just regrettable. You know, I, I, I just wonder that, you know, in, in a country of 330-some million people, 350 million people, I mean, I, I think that we could come up with something better than a rematch of the last election, maybe. I don't know. I mean, Run, HR. But, but, you know, but I'm not a political scientist, you know, so... Uh, but it- <laughs> one thing you know about three minute videos from both of these guys is those that are those are written by staffs. So it would be hilarious to see a three minute video that you just uh, OK, guys, you got to make it up three minutes. Go now uh, <laughs> on both sides. I think um, uh, what we're learning is that the American primary system is has some problems to it. And the days of the smoke filled room had all sorts of problems, but at least they were focused on vetting candidates, producing vaguely reasonable candidates who might have a chance of both winning a general election uh, and uh, also governing with with some degree of responsibility. Uh, And I think, um, you know, lots of I've seen this in The New York Times and The Wall Street Journal. Uh, So I think people are coming to realize that there's a real problem with how we select the candidates in the first place. Uh, that we, with great benches on both sides, uh, you know, the bench of, even the bench of the other announced Republican candidates are all pretty darn good. And the Democrats have plenty of pretty darn uh, good people too, uh, who ought to be um, selected somehow. And when we, this isn't the moment for how you improve the primary system, but there's, when you see problems, don't just look at personalities, look at something's wrong in the, in the rule book. And there's certainly something wrong in the rule book here. And we will leave it there for this show. Uh, We're not going to reconvene until the second half of May, which means that Mother's Day will have come and gone by then. I'd like to wish all three of you a happy Mother's Day and that I hope that you and your children spend it celebrating each of your remarkable wives. I've met all your spouses and they are all just tremendous ladies. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. So that's it for this episode of Goodfellas. As I mentioned, we will be we will be back in the second half of May. Um, our next episode will feature the writer, podcaster, and opinion columnist Coleman Hughes. I imagine we're going to be talking about race and public policy. Uh, you don't miss this episode. On behalf of my colleagues, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, and John Cochran, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, we hope you enjoyed today's show, and we will see you soon. Take care, and thanks for watching.